Hello and welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Ravi Joshi. I'm the co-executive director of the Council of Canadians. I'm here to offer a few introductory words and I'll also be joined by uh, my colleague and co-executive director, Christina Warner. Um, while we have participants joining us from coast to coast to coast, the Council of Canadians main offices are located in downtown Ottawa on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The Council continues to work as allies to support and raise up the voices of Indigenous people who are struggling to defend their land and protect the water in, in, and in service of the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Today is May 5th. It is the day, a National Day of Awareness of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and girl, Girls and Two Spirit. Today we observe and pledge action to address the persistent and deliberate human rights and Indigenous rights violations and abuses which are the root cause behind the Canada's staggering rates of violence against Indigenous women, girls, and 2S LGBTQIA people. We encourage all of our guests from across the country to learn about the land they are on, about Indigenous people and nations that have lived, that have lived on and cared for the land since time immemorial. Uh, as well as treaties and the history and impact of colonization. We hope you all live in solidarity and act and actively support local Indigenous communities. Now, if you're new to the Council of Canadians, we welcome you. Even if you hold views that are different from ours, we welcome you and hope tonight offers you a chance to better understand us and the work we do. Our mission is to bring people together through collective action and grassroots organizing to challenge the power and influence of corporations and advocate for people, the planet, and our democracy. We believe that the future of our democracy hangs in the balance of this moment, most notably with the rise of hate groups and far-right groups, many backed by powerful and wealthy individuals and corporations, with the aim, uh, forgive me, we aim to combat this through relationships and organizing that build community power. You can see this in our current campaigns to champion public water against the world's largest water profiteers, to tackle the climate crisis and take on the oil and gas giants while promoting a just transition from fossil fuels. And we seek to defend public services and promote equity by taking on big pharma and promoting universal pharmacare here at home and vaccine justice around the world. And we back all of this up with a clear mandate from over 200,000 supporters from across, this, from across the country. We're staunchly independent, nonpartisan, and funded entirely without the backing of corporations or governments. Instead, we do this work thanks to the financial support from tens of thousands of our grassroots donors. Over 92% of our funding comes from people like you tuning in tonight. If you are a member, of the member or donor of the council, thank you for your steadfast and lasting support. If you aren't already one of our members or donors, we encourage you to join this movement by signing up as a member today. And if you're not quite there yet, we could still use your support to chip in to support this evening's event and events like it. So become a, me a member of the Council of Canadians, chip in or support our work. We'll post the link into the chat. Once again, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Christina Warner, my co-executive director for further comments. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi, and welcome everyone. Throughout its history, the Council has raised the issue of police engagement during protest. Our chapters, staff, supporters, and allies have been on the receiving end at times of police aggression during protest, as well as surveillance of human rights and progressive organizing. Police accountability, for that reason, is central to the Council's understanding of the right to protest, to our understanding of justice, and in our understanding of reconciliation. We know that in Canada, the color of your skin or whether or not you are Indigenous still makes a difference in whether or not the police are likely to mistreat, arrest, or incarcerate you. This has been true throughout Canada's history, from early contact through residential schools to today's child welfare and court systems. And if we don't tell the stories and listen to the histories and tell the stories of today, then we can collectively forget that this thing was created and sustained for such a purpose to maintain a way of life that gathers resources and wealth for settler communities by the act of killing and taking resources from those who are indigenous, their communities, and from people of color. It's also why today it's important to take part in the day of awareness for murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited individuals. This settler colonialism is ongoing, but only if we consent to it. Our climate and water depend on ending the related extractive projects. Our ability to reconcile and build a world where we all contribute to the abundance around us 
and to the abundance in one another depends on it. With the current resurgence of the far right in Canada, we're paying renewed attention to the role of police in our society. We're turning to people like those on tonight's panel who have lived, led, organized, and researched anti-racism and anti-hate in Canada to learn about our shared histories and identify ways to create something different together. We're grateful you're here with us, that you chose to be a part of this conversation, and we ask that you consider supporting their individual work and their individual movements as you consider what action you might take on the other end of this evening's event. Some housekeeping. We are happy to welcome 406 and counting participants on this webinar, so welcome to each of you. We encourage you to put questions for panelists into the question and answer box that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So your little Q&A icon down there will take you to that spot. But we know with this many folks, we've got about a thousand other folks who could potentially join us. We know that we won't be able to get to every question, but please know that there are four of us on the back end of this filtering your questions and we'll get every topic you raise before the panelists as we're able to. You will have received a survey leading up to this webinar. Thank you to those who filled it out. If you have not done so, please do. We are interested in your thoughts and how these topics impact you. And finally, much of tonight's conversation focuses on issues we all care deeply about. Please take time to care for yourself as you need and approach the panelists and others joining with similar care. We won't allow any questions or comments that are racist, sexist, or rooted in other forms of oppression, and we will remove participants who raise them. With that, I'd like to begin tonight's discussion by introducing our moderator. Anne Logasse Dowson is an award-winning radio and TV commentator in Montreal. Anne worked at the CBC and Radio Canada for 20 years, hosting her own shows in Montreal, as well as working as a producer and host at As It Happens and Cross Country Checkup. She now does commentary with Bell Media, Videotron, and Kojeko, and holds an MA in Canadian and Women's Studies. Thanks, Anne. Thank you very much, Christina, and thanks to Ravi, and thanks to all of you who join us, and especially to our wonderful panelists. Bonsoir et bienvenue à toutes et tous. Je me trouve à Montréal, Jojage, sur le territoire non cédé des Kanyankahaga de la Haudenosaunee. I'm speaking to you front from Montreal or Jojage on unceded Mohawk territory. It is great to be with you to talk about these critical issues that are weighing on our minds, on so many of our minds post Ottawa occupation. So thank you very much for joining us. And I thought I'd mention that I, when I was preparing and doing some research, I found a study that was funded by Heritage Canada for the Canadian Centre for Justice and Community Safety Statistics. And it said that one in five Black Canadians and one in five Indigenous people have little or no confidence in the police. Uh, that's double the proportion of non-Indigenous and uh, non-visible minorities. So, uh, and I suspect that that number is maybe on the low side. One in three Black and Indigenous people said that police are performing poorly, according to that same study. And we know that Indigenous people and Black people are overwhelmingly overrepresented in police-involved deaths here in Canada. We also saw during the Ottawa occupation in February, that there's a pattern of low police interventions in convoy-like demonstrations. And before that, anti-vaccine demonstrations, the data shows that police are twice as likely to engage with indigenous and environmental activists. Police forces have quickly and brutally shut down Black Lives Matter protests, land defenders at Wet'suwet'en and elsewhere, encampments of unhoused people, fishers in Nova Scotia, to name just a few. So this double standard, which came into crystal clear focus in Ottawa, was part of the genesis of tonight's panel. Um, we saw that the Ottawa police did little or nothing and even assisted the trucker occupiers during that almost month long occupation. So we've asked four thinkers and activists from across the country to address issues of policing, protest, and the resurgence of the far right. And they join us now, we have with us Slado or Molly Wickham. She is a land defender in Wet'suwet'en. She joins us from BC. She holds an MA in First Nations Governance. Elle Jones teaches and does research at Mount St. Vincent University. She's a well-known author and critic and poet. She was the poet laureate, laureate of Nova Scotia and she's going to read a poem to us to close the, to this evening's proceedings. 
Erica Eiffel is an economist, blogger, and activist in Ottawa, and Barbara Perry is the director of the Center on Hate, Bias, and Extremism at the Ontario Technical University in Oshawa, and she also holds the UNESCO Chair in Hate Studies. So a very impressive group of people with a lot of things to say. We're going to try and be as expeditious as we can, and I'm going to ask Slato to open this evening's proceedings with her comments. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, that it is National Day of Awareness for Murdering Missing Indigenous Women, and it's not lost on us that we are um, holding a demonstration today for one of our Wet'suwet'en women who was just murdered, um, at the same time as we're holding um, this panel here. Um, there's so much violence that happens to our people on a regular basis. Um, there's so much violence that happens to Indigenous women on the territories, and particularly on the front lines. Um, I'm part of an uh, occupation on Gidimden territory. I hold an, a hereditary chief name in the Cassia House of the Gidimden clan of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. And for three years, um, we've set up an occupation um, in response to Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, which is a fracked gas pipeline um, heading to Kitimat um, to export LNG to overseas markets. Um, in three years of being on the territory um, in this village site, we've seen three militarized raids. Um, we are a traditional governance system of the Wet'suwet'en people. We go by our traditional laws on the land, um, and we uphold those as we have every right to do within our system and our laws, um, and even within you know, Canadian law um, under this constitution and um, under the UNDRIP and international law. And so that is what we've been doing on our lands, building infrastructure, building um, resistance and in defense of our laws and our way of life, not in defense of this one particular project, but so that we can keep surviving. And in the face of that, we've seen, um, you know, the kinds of raids that have come and the kinds of violence that have come to our territories have been in stark contrast to the kinds of enforcement that you've seen in the trucker convoy um, in anything that is not land-based or in, led by indigenous people or black people, um, you see a stark, stark contrast in the, that kind of enforcement. And so in all three raids, we experienced um, sniper rifles, canine units, um, hundreds of police officers with tactical teams being dropped um, by helicopter to surround unarmed Indigenous people on our own lands, um, to be forcibly removed at gunpoint um, and jailed and imprisoned um, on our own territories, which is a huge, um, you know, and I, I feel like this, a lot of people have seen this in the media, a lot of people have seen the videos of, you know, this past November, I was forcibly removed with other Indigenous land defenders from a tiny house after they axed, after the RCMP used our own axe and our own chainsaw to axe down the door and chainsaw down the door with canine units on guard. Um, standing and waiting at the door, snarling, while tactical teams had semi-automatic weapons pointed at our at our heads. This is the kind of violence that happens to us all the time. This has been going on since contact. This is the kind of um, the policing that happens here in Wet'suwet'en territory, and it's on and it hasn't stopped. You know, we received our third letter from CERD from the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, you know, telling Canada that they have to do better, that they have to withdraw policing, that they have to withdraw the special um, unit of RCMP called CERG, um, Community Industry Response Group, that has been developed specifically to police, harass, intimidate, and bring violence to Indigenous people standing up for their rights and their land. And these are the people that we are dealing with every day. These people are coming in, um, I think in April, there was 200 and, uh, 287 boots on the ground at Get Em Done Checkpoint. O over 94 visits in one month by police with that many boots on the ground, invading, harassing, intimidating our people in our village sites. And so this is something that is ongoing. It's still happening today. The police come up to my home where my children live. They come into our village site where our 
elders are living. Um, this is not something that went away in November after the raid. This is something that we are enduring every single day. Um, and it is in stark contrast to the kinds of enforcement that happened to anybody else. Um, and it's becoming normalized. This is something that is uh, that is very normalized. The violence that happens to its Uitin people is become saturated in the public. Um, and it's being normalized with the violence against our lands um, and the white supremacy and the oppression that's happening um, across so-called Canada. So just a few words to open up in our experiences here on the front line as Indigenous land defenders who are upholding our rights and our title to defend our territories and our lives. Um, as Indigenous people. Aotsa. Thank you very much, Slato. It's great to have you with us from far off BC from the West Coast. I'm going to ask Elle Jones to now speak to us briefly about her work and her ideas post-convoy. I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Classic. everybody. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here in Javuktuk, um, Mi'kmaq territory, the unceded and unsurrendered lands of the Mi'kmaq people. I don't know if, how quickly I can do this, but uh, when we were watching the Ottawa convoy, the Ottawa occupation, uh, many people were saying things like, why can't the police just do their jobs? And there was a conversation taking place that was really about defunding, where people started pointing out like how much money the police make, right? So that these are people making in like over $100,000 a year, half of the sunshine list in your city will be cops, you know, millions of dollars a day for policing and couldn't even stop people from bringing gas into the site. But I think it's really important to walk that back a bit and think about what that means, because people would say, why won't the police do their jobs, but the police actually were doing their jobs, because historically, the job of the police is to uphold the social order meaning to uphold white supremacy to uphold capitalism to uphold power relations of dominance. So as somebody who obviously has worked on defunding the police, we did a report for the Board of Police Commissioners in Halifax defining defunding, but really a public consultation. Um, these are really the issues that we're looking at. So the first thing to understand is that policing is not just a practice, it's an ideology, right? So even though when we talk about policing, we most often are focusing on like the actual RCMP or your actual municipal police or provincial police, um, policing is also an idea. It's an idea of punishment and discipline and control. And it, that is, is based in power hierarchies in society. So in Canada, for example, our sort of top cop is the Minister of Public Safety. And what we call public safety, and by the way, in Canada, that's Bill Blair, like, or, and you know, now they split it into two. So they promoted the immigration minister to Minister of Public Safety who deports people, which should concern us. And then Bill Blair, who was Toronto police chief during the G20, which is this huge violation of civil rights in Canada. And his reward is, of course, to become like one of the highest ranking cabinet ministers. So what we call public safety is, who do we think of the public? Everybody who's not black, if you're not indigenous, drug user, trans or queer, a sex worker, somebody with mental illness, indigenous. These are all the people that have historic people with disabilities that have been considered to be outside of the idea of the public. And safety is predicated on the idea of keeping us controlled and disciplined and away from the property of white people, right? This is very much the roots of what policing is here to do. And not only through policing forces, but also through things like how people will stop you on the street if you're black walking, how people will call the police on an unhoused person. If somebody's asking for money outside of Tim Hortons, people will feel uncomfortable and rely on a policing response. So this is what I mean by saying that policing is also an ideology as well as a practice. Policing also takes place at a number of sites. We tend to think of it as being just like the cops, but it also includes border control, CBSA, as the only police force in Canada with absolutely no external oversight. You cannot complain about CBSA. It goes to another officer that's a CBSA officer. There's literally no controls. Also, we often talk about carceral care, meaning like the policing that takes place in the child welfare system. Things like birth alerts that they're just recently eliminating, literally showing up at the hospital to remove babies, particularly from indigenous women before they've even had the chance to parent. Um, teachers and school suspensions, the school to prison pipeline. So all these different sites, hospitals where healthcare workers will call the police, particularly on unhoused people or people with drug addictions or people in mental health crisis, right? So I know I'm, I'm trying to do short and it's hard to do this quickly, but just to understand that um, we need to think of policing quite broadly and not just about the police to understand how police embeds itself in every institution, and even the places that we think of as places of care and healing often, especially for racialized and indigenous people become places of punishment as well. So what is defunding? Uh, some people get 
really angry about this term. I think they're angry because it's actually direct. So people sometimes say, if you guys just wouldn't call it defunding, you would have more success. But I actually think it's a slogan that captures exactly what we're talking about, which is in society, we fund what we value. And over the years, particularly since austerity politics and the rise of neoliberalism, we've seen a divestment from public funds into the things that actually sustain our communities and give us real safety, things like housing, things like access to treatment and care, education, the ability to walk on a well-lit street, safe transit, all these things are what we think of as safety, the ability to have your child care, all of that. And what we actually invest in is policing and punishment. So when we talk about defunding, we are simply talking about shifting the resources from policing and punishment and putting them into initiatives that actually prevent crime, that keep us whole and healthy, and that contribute to the well-being of our communities. At the heart of that is something we call detasking, which is simply removing tasks from the police that they are not equipped to do and placing them with the appropriate organization. So that would be things like mental health care, right? Like the police should not be called in mental crisis. Um, they have no qualifications for that. They are not Social workers, not that social workers also don't do their own harm. So that's the basics of defunding. And then very quickly, um, this is part of a broader idea that many of us talk about called abolition. This can be controversial to people. And this is the idea on the surface, it's very much about um, trying to not rely on punishment and policing and prisons as a social solution, recognizing that crime is caused by social factors and is not solved by punishing. But more broadly, it's actually more of also an idea about how we live in this world. So, you know, Molly, sorry, Slato talked about, um, you know, the police as in force being a colonial force, right? A, a force that also abuses animals, brings in canine units to abuse indigenous people on their own lands because indigenous people are the biggest threat to the profit in this country. Indigenous sovereignty is the biggest threat to pipelines, to gas, to the profits of corporations, right? And police are heavily embedded in that. So abolition really looks at capitalism. It looks at how we live with the land and live with each other. And we try to shift our relations. Understanding that if we're not going to rely on police and punishment, we have to be able to do something in our communities, right? So I often say like, we ain't getting rid of prisons tomorrow because we can't even deal with rapists in our friend circles. So how are we gonna talk about you know, dealing with like harm, which is real, right? Many of the, the people that actually, the people that began abolition were black feminists who had experienced violence and understood intimately the harm that happens. So to wrap up in like one more minute, um, as abolitionists, we're not naive, it's not about pretending that there's no harm, that everybody just needs a hug. It's about saying the solutions we're using now actually are not long-term solutions. They don't actually address the roots of what we're talking about. And we can more effectively address things like crime and harm um, through investing in community and through rethinking many of our relationships with things like unhoused people. Like, why do we invest in police while people don't have housing? Why do we invest in a drug war while we have a toxic drug supply crisis? All of these things. And then in the last 10 seconds, uh, policing is, of course, based in white supremacy. It's based in the control and discipline of Black people and Indigenous people. The RCMP as a force were created. They were the Northwest police to push the frontier. So when we talk about white supremacy and policing, we're not just talking about like, oh, this one cop might be a member of the Proud Boys, or this one cop is this. And so that's a few bad apples. We have to understand the institution of policing is based in these power structures. It is inherently about that. And that doesn't mean that an individual police officer that, you know, coaches your kid's basketball team is therefore a hardcore white supremacist racist. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that policing and punishment will always be founded on who is part of the public and deserves safety and who is not. And we cannot simply undo that by minor reforms like body cameras or, you know, getting more black cops. That is not going to work to undo what we're really talking about, which is power and property relationships under settler colonial capitalism and anti-black racism. Sorry, that was longer than I wanted, but still really quick, but that's the pricey. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much, Al Jones. Sorry to make you feel rushed, but we're trying to squeeze a lot of really great content in a short, short time. I'm going to ask um, uh, Erica Eiffel to join us now to tell us a little bit about her thinking about policing, having experienced the trucker occupation and having worked with the police board in Ottawa. So Erica, can you unmute yourself and join us? Yeah. I'm unmuted. Hi. Hi. My name is Erica Eiffel. I am a political journalist and econ oh, economist. So I write about federal politics. Um, mostly I have my own column in the Hill Times. And basically, I've been writing about the rise of white supremacy for a couple, 
to be honest, probably as long as um, I've had my podcast, Bad and Bitchy, which is about five years. And um, I think what was, you know, what has the, the shock and awe of Ottawa, there are two sort of responses to the Ottawa protests. Either it was not a big deal or there was shock and awe. And the shock and awe is usually reserved to the people in Ottawa who experienced it. Um, so I live, I, I've, I live in Hintonburg, which is a part of Ottawa where um, Abdirman Abdi was murdered by the Ottawa police. So basically that spot is about three minute walk maybe from my place. So um, the impact of the Ottawa police and their tactics and their tactics against black and brown people really, really resonates with me. At the time that that happened, the Ottawa police had, um, uh, there was a community sort of liaison uh, organization called Compact. And I remember going to a Compact meeting after that murder had happened and that the Ottawa police, in response to Constable Daniel, Daniel Monsion being arrested for his murder, um, sold wristbands to support their fallen soldier. And I say soldier because policing and the army, policing and the military are very much interlinked. The way they operate is pretty much is there's little difference. And if you look over time and um, Elle mentioned Bill Blair, so let's go back to 2010 and let's go back to how we are um, supporting and funding their, this police, these our police forces, our municipal police forces to actually have sort of military gear to deal with civilian protesters. And guess who they're using the military gear on? They're not using the military gear on the convoy protesters. And I use the word, you know what? Let's not call them protesters. Let's just call them occupiers because that's what they were. And I'm tired of this freedom convoy nonsense because I literally walked downtown in Ottawa when they were here. And I have a picture of a van that says, this is not about vaccine mandates. It's about freedom. Yet all the press that came in here really became the stenographers, not only for the police, but for the convoy. If we're gonna talk about policing, let's talk about how media really does act as the transcribers for police. Okay, so. Going back to um, Compact, I remember the, inter the man who is now interim police chief, Steve Bell, defend those officers. I remember him saying to us, the black community, oh, well, you know, it's just officers supporting their friend as though we should just understand. So the rot in the Ottawa police is deep. It is, um, it is instructive to how they deal with different communities. And what became very clear is that the Ottawa police isn't even worried about looking like they're being biased or being racist. They have shared texts with the convoy supporters. They have given money to, convoys, to the convoy. So you tell me, which side are they on? if there's a side. Um, Ellen, I'm gonna repeat you a little bit, which is um, the, the police are here to protect the interest of power. That's it. They're not here for average citizens. No, they're here to protect power. They're here to protect capitalist resources. They're here to protect the whole idea of Canada as a resource-driven economy. That's what they're here to protect. Nothing more, nothing less. That's it. Because I know when I went into Twitter spaces and there were mostly white Twitter spaces, there was a lot of questions like, there was a lot of, um, um, I think a lot of people were just stunned. 
And um, I, I, I talk about white space, white Twitter spaces, because a lot of the, the conversation was, how can we get the police to do their job? Whereas when we as a podcast, along with Citizens Against More Surveillance or CAMS, which is um, sort of like a, um, uh, an activism group here in Ottawa, we held a BIPOC-centered space because there were none. And so that's Black Indigenous people of color, just in case you didn't know. But we did that and the conversation was completely different. The conversation was, um, how do we move past policing? And so what I'm saying, what I'm saying is the impact of this convoy was not equitable. The impact of this convoy was, um, was more detrimental to people with disabilities who are already afraid of the police, to LGBTQ, 2IA um, people, and to spirited people who are already afraid of the police. A lot of the mutual aid was being done that was being done was not only to, to keep people safe from the convoy, but also to keep people safe from police. The idea that police are somehow the be all and end all in safety is a marketing ploy. It is a gimmick. And so, um, you know, Ottawa that used to be like the place where fun goes to die <laughs> um, really has had, it, had its fair share um, of these sort of protests, as you know, I'm sure Rolling Thunder, the biking protest came in last weekend, and we really are respect, um, expecting huge protests on Canada Day. A lot of people would ask, where was the authority? Um, and, you know, Chief Slowly was blamed for the uh, breakdown of policing. And I use breakdown of policing very loosely. Um, Chief Slowly, and the reason I br bring up Abdirman Abdi, was that Chief Slowly was brought in to clean up the Ottawa police. Um, the cat, like in an article by Ottawa Life magazine, quote, rapes and lies, the cancerous misconduct at the Ottawa police services the Ottawa Police Service, because it's not only Black and Indigenous people. The Ottawa Police Service has failed women in when it comes to sexual assault and sexual abuse. They have failed LGBTQ people. They have failed people with disabilities. Basically, they've failed everybody who's not white and male. Um, this article goes on to say, the criminal legal system in Ottawa is dysfunctional to its core. The police are corrupt. The Crown prosecutors have no integrity, judgment, or have integrity, judgment, and credibility issues. And the decisions of local judges in multiple cases are causing the public to question whether justice depends on your race or position in society. Erica, I'm going to jump in. And then we're going to come back and do further discussion because I gave everybody a pretty strict time. Did I? You're a bit did over I, time. I, did I, I go over be, time? Just a pitch. <laughs> Not much. It's hard. I prepared for eight so minutes. Much, I was so like, eight say. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you guys. No, that's okay. I apologize. And I, I really like to learn it's about okay. I'm still holding the record. Goes to die because I think the joke was after the convoy, make Ottawa boring again. And yes. <laughs> Sorry, Al. Did you have something to say? I, I didn't mean. No, to I just said I took longer. It's okay. I'm still. I'm still. Oh no, no, no. It's not. A, I don't want to be the time police of all things, but I do want everybody to get a chance. So, um, I'm going to ask Barbara Perry now to speak to us. She's the director of the Center on Hate, Bias, and Extremism at the Ontario Tech University, and very knowledgeable about hate groups. Now, we just heard Erica talking about white supremacist ideas about the failures of the Ottawa police. Bill Blair said something along the lines about a year ago that he was worried about alt-right alt groups infiltrating the police force. He actually said that. I don't know what was done after he said that, but he isn't unaware of it. Anyway, so over to you, Barbara. 
Uh, yeah, now I feel like I have to change directions in terms of what I was going to say. And, and okay. it, it's horrible to make me follow these three fantastic women uh, who are, are so yeah. articulate in, uh, in expressing um, their own experiences and, and observations. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about the far right and really what the convoy, uh, some of the things that the convoy told us to, uh, about the movement. And I think one of the most important things there is the uh, extent to which they were able to um, sort of that capacity that they, that they had to organize on such an incredibly large scale, uh, largely through social media, both encrypted and unencrypted uh, spaces there, even by text. So some, you know, very obvious sort of what is now, I think, old style uh, means of, uh, of communication. And it wasn't just excuse me, organizing amongst those leaders who we know have very deep, deep roots and long roots uh, in the far right movement, but also outreach to others who are not, weren't necessarily part of the far right, probably still wouldn't consider themselves to be part of the far right. But again, that's another uh, element at which the, the, the you know, far right extremist groups and individuals are so adept and that is exploiting the fears, the anxieties, the concerns of, uh, of ordinary people, right? Those popular concerns, those grievances, those anxieties that we've all been experiencing exacerbated by the conspiracy theories, by the disinformation that, again, the far right uh, it, you know, uh, yield, wields uh, in a very effective manner uh, in terms of expanding its audience and expanding its reach uh, to uh, you know, sort of the, the broader population. So we're seeing the demographic shift in the movement. So more older, sort of middle-aged and older people, uh, educated people, you know, well-employed uh, people, not just disenfranchised youth uh, are being now drawn into the movement. So we're seeing the normalization of those uh, those sorts of narratives associated with the uh, with the far right. I think the other thing, uh, one of the other things that we learned, and that obviously law enforcement sort of denied, ignored, uh, and and uh, trod upon, uh, were the 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 breadth and the depth of the risks posed by this sort of organizing as well. Obviously the threats to public safety uh, that Erica spoke about in terms of uh, the violence, the harassment, the intimidation of folks living in and uh, in, in trying to uh, move about the, the downtown area. We heard about the harassment at, um, uh, you know, at, at soup kitchens, for example, and, and shelters, those sorts of things. We heard about the hate crimes uh, perpetrated against uh, the queer communities uh, across the across the city, uh, a whole array of, of other problems as well that really have gone unremarked in uh, in many respects. So you know, relative silence uh, around that when you know it's another part of of the uh, the crisis. I think we should be uh, confronting here. Of course, the threats to national security, not just in terms of Ottawa, but also in terms of the uh, the blockades, the border blockades uh, across the country. Now, keep in mind that there was a piece of it legislation introduced in Alberta to intended to block other blockades uh, that was not wielded uh, in this particular case. Coincidence? Not at all. Uh, but again, we did see the danger. We saw the risk, right, with the, uh, the discovery of the, the cache of weapons by uh, a group affiliated with Diagonal, uh, with, with infidels uh, as well. So those threats. Also the, the threat, the risk posed clearly uh, to uh, democratic processes, uh, you know, the attempt to overthrow. I think that the, uh, the, the absurdity uh, that they thought they could overthrow the government uh, with the governor general's uh, assistance. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that was, whether tongue in cheek, whether it was, you know, uh, whether it was, you know, really intentional, um, it, it raises the specter, uh, I think. Um, add to that, right, these claims about the tyrannical state and state overreach uh, that also, you know, plays to those anxieties, those public anxieties we were talking about before, and magnifies uh, that erosion of faith in key institutions in society, including the state, including the media, including science, right? If we think about those conspiracy theories that challenge the science of the vaccine, challenge the science of, uh, of COVID, in fact, well, it was just a hoax, uh, or it was a conspiracy uh, by by Jews or by Soros himself or by the Asians, pick your pick your enemy. 
Um, and so I, I think all those narratives, uh, you know, also pose a, another risk, a broader risk uh, there. Uh, and of course, I, you know, I don't need to say more uh, about what it also tells us in terms of the failure of law enforcement, or, or perhaps the success, uh, as you've all pointed out, of law enforcement, if we keep in mind that, yeah, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, they were grounded not in the slave patrols as in the U.S., but as, uh, you know, an entity intended to remove Indigenous peoples from their land, uh, uh, so it could be exploited by the Hudson's Bay Company, obviously, but also by uh, by white settlers uh, of the day. Uh, and so, you know, we see that the structural racism, racism and white supremacy that's built in uh, to the institution of policing, but also then, uh, you know, in addition to that, right, we do have uh, the individual forms of racism that played out so frequently with the, you'll all remember the, the Photoshop uh, OPP cruiser. <clears throat> Uh, that uh, the officer was allowing people to uh, to use to take photos. Uh, the video uh, of another, I think that was another RCMP officer who said, I'm behind you 100%, I get you, uh, you know, on, on video, several videos like that. I got a letter from someone from uh, the, she was former military uh, that was, you know, making these claims of freedom and, and the tyrannical state. Uh, and it was also signed by a number of people associated with Mounties for Freedom, Police for freedom, uh, all of whom shared some of that same disinformation that we saw associated uh, with the far right. Uh, so that, you know, that, that sympathy is, is very clear and apparent there. Uh, so I think that, you know, a big part of our, our conversation tonight, and I thank you all for, uh, for leading us into that, uh, is, you know, obviously, you know, countering and pushing back against law enforcement in this context. But I think one of the other things that I, I want to inject here is a conversation about, for a long time, I've talked about the importance of critical digital literacy in the context of, of pushing back against the far right. But I think what the, the convoy taught us is that we also need to think about uh, critical civic literacy, uh, the, the ignorance that was exploitable in many respects by the far right. I mean, we heard talk, people talking about the Eighth Amendment, the Second Amendment, the First Amendment. People, we're in Canada. Uh, we are not bound by the American Constitution. Um, so I think that there is, uh, you know, a, a gap there that is exploitable uh, by the far right. And I think that we need to we need to start thinking about how we're going to fill those gaps uh, as well. So looking forward to uh, our conversations and where, that, where, where these take us. Thank you very much, Barbara. So I'm going to start, I would like the panelists to interact with each other insofar as that is possible. So I'm going to start by throwing a question back to Slato about the RCMP. Um, and maybe Barbara can jump in on the RCMP because we know that there have been uh, investigations into infiltration of the RCMP. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police was such an antiquated name. Anyway, they've, they, sp they spend millions and millions and millions of Canadian tax dollars in quotes, policing people on their own land in places like Wet'suwet'en. And, um, the, you know, the numbers that uh, you quoted, Slato, of the guys, the boots on the ground are mind boggling. We're talking about small communities of unarmed people. I mean, it just sounds like an, it sounds like an occupation, basically. Um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what your, what do you observe amongst the RCMP? Have you ever had conversations with them about their presence? Is there any kind of discussion or debate? And if so, what, how would you characterize the, the culture of these people who have landed on your doorstep in this way? Yeah, thanks for that question, actually. Um, as you know, many other, all, almost all the other panelists have stated that the RCMP are here to uphold the crown. Um, when they first started coming into invading our territories and into our village site specifically, um, you know, they were coming in starting between four to eight times a day, sometimes every two hours, sometimes at four o'clock in the morning, our elder would have to come out in her nightgown and her slippers. Um, she was, you know, she's been pushed. Um, people have been attacked by the police. Um, there have been arrests, illegal arrests, illegal detainments. And at the very beginning, they came in um, with different excuses. So we're here for your safety. 
Um, they broke down our gate. They were cutting the chains, stealing the locks and the chains, threatening people with arrest if they wanted to get them back, um, saying this isn't a private residence. Um, we are here for everybody's safety. We want to, we, you know, we heard that something happened to your gate, so we want to come and help you. Is there anything that we can do? We got a call that um, your, something happened to your gate. Um, so just really, really bizarre things. Um, we started challenging them on what is your legal authority to be here? And so they they quickly were like, oh, what is our legal authority to be here? Uh, we don't have one. Uh-oh, we better go talk to some lawyers. And so they started coming back and um, targeting people, targeting me specifically, saying that they're there to ensure that I don't violate my bail conditions from the arrest that happened in November, which limits me to be on my own territory um, unless I'm hunting, fishing, or for any other cultural purposes. So I'm not allowed to be on my territory unless I'm doing one of those things. Um, otherwise, I'll be put back in jail. And so they're there sometimes every two hours to do that. Um, but one of the best things and what is most clear about the function and reality of them coming in every sometimes two hours, like three to four times a day now, um, is that they're saying, this is crown land and we're allowed to walk around on crown land. We can do whatever we want on crown land. And when we say you're trespassing, this is Wet'suwet'en territory, this is Wasa's territory. No, it's not, it's crown land. We can walk around on crown land wherever we want. But I bet if we were walking around their house at four o'clock in the morning, you know, outside on the street on crown land, you know, every two hours or every four hours, what would happen to us? But it just shows that they're trying to assert their authority. They're trying to assert the authority of this private corporation that's trying to trespass through our territories and destroy our lands. They're asserting the power and the authority of, you know, the assumed jurisdiction of the crown. Um, and that's exactly what they're there for. They're trying to make it so difficult for us to live on our lands, which is what they've been doing forever. You know, they used to come with the Indian agents and tell our and burn down our, our people's cabins and make and move them onto the reserves. They used to come and move, you know, as soon as they would build a new house, so, you know, some families in Wet'suwet'en territory, they've been moved three, four times as children in their lives because the Indian agent and the RCMP come and they say, get off your land or you're going to jail. And that's what they're doing to us. They're trying to make it impossible for us to live on our land um, for crown interests that are backed, you know, that are tied inherently to these private corporations. Um, I wondered, uh, one of the issues that uh, we've talked a bit about, Eric and I, among other things, is the amount of tax dollars that goes not just to the RCMP to do what Molly, what Slato was just describing, but also just the police budgets continue to go up and up. And even the Fraser Institute is saying, you know, the police budgets go up and up, but the crime rate is dropping. So I wondered if somebody wanted to jump in on that on that issue, which is just like it's an incredibly poor investment in terms of you know yeah. spending all that money. And this is the mythology of policing, right? That we are raised from the time, you know, my sister had an alphabet book for her child and it said J is for justice with a picture of a cop. So she like took that page out. <laughs> his, name's, his name's Jericho. So she like rewrote the page, you know, like we have <laughs> the, the dog on Paw Patrol, right? The cop dog that's given to us the same as Rubble, the construction dog, right? Um, we have prison Lego, we have prison Playmobil. So from the time we're a child, we have this idea of like policing being shoved down our throats. Between a third and 50% of any content we consume in media in a year is, is crime, either true crime, the news about crime, or fictional shows about crime. And I think something like 50% of fictional shows about crime are like cop shows. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're just saturated with this. So to try and have a conversation with people, and this is also what, you know, Barb was saying about civic literacy. It's also things like policing literacy. Like if you're you know, you don't have cause. First of all, if you haven't encountered the police, you don't really have cause to think about what they actually do when they encounter you. If you've never had a mental health crisis or you're not black or indigenous and, you know, you live in a, a, a gated community or whatever, you may not have had that kind of interaction. And then, you know, you see crime overplayed on the news. Black people, for example, are represented only as criminals and never represented as victims, even though we're much more likely to be victimized by crime. So you have all of these myths. And of course, people believe them, who then go and sit on juries and like convict black people and believe that black people are solely carrying guns, right? So this is part of the problem. So then when you try to say, but, you know, the police 
aren't working class, for example. They're not like salt of the earth Irish working class. They're making a hundred plus thousand dollars a year. You know, that the police budget and, and when we add in CBSA and prisons, you know, it's like billions and billions and billions of dollars on punishment while we're told, well, you know, we can't afford a healthcare system. So, you know, but to try and have that conversation with people, people kind of believe this. So it's hard to, you know, you know it's almost, I, I always use my Pluto as a planet analogy, right? And now it might be back to being a planet, but you know, when they were like, Pluto isn't a planet. And if you're just like, but I got the sticker set at Walmart, like it had Pluto in it. Like, you know, <laughs> and, and, and astronomers try to tell you, but it's not right. Like, but we, we believe these things is what I'm saying. I'm not making fun of people. I'm not saying people are stupid. I'm saying that if you're saturated in the society on policing, then it is very hard to have a realistic and fact-based and evidence-based idea of what policing actually does because it's attached to ideas of safety, authority, order. These are powerful things. And finally, I'm trying not to talk too long. I mean, with what Molly was saying, the offensiveness of freedom being co-opted, you know, so like, you know, how the right wing has totally taken on freedom. Of course, they didn't care when black people were being policed in COVID, right? When black and indigenous people and unhoused people and drug users in the first wave in particular were being fined and policed and incarcerated and black doctors were being run out of New Brunswick, there was no freedom convoy. But like this individualist selfish idea of freedom you can't make me wear a mask i'm like wait till you hear about bras like you know like oh putting a mask on my face is like the biggest oh my god how can i you know and, and this idea that this becomes freedom and you know all the unfreedoms that immigrants experience and indigenous people experience that black people experience that people with disabilities experience that's natural and actually belongs to us, right? So people don't get shook when black people being racially profiled. We're supposed to be racially profiled. That's normal. But how dare you stop me from occupying your city, right? It's a very an equitable idea of freedom. Um, but these are again, like just very powerful, powerful mythologies. Um, and part of this is to have conversations as uncomfortable as it can be. It can be hard. Like when you're hearing, you know, the same people say, you want murderers running society and you're trying to like be like, but. Have you really looked at the budget? Do you know we spend money on lie detectors? Like, why are we spending all this money on police horses? Like, you know, when you actually go line by line in the budget and how little is given to like victim services and how much is given to completely useless things. But yeah, it's very, very difficult because I, I there's a series of very powerful beliefs that are about people's safety and about, you know, if you've taught from birth that the police keep you safe, it is very difficult to begin to undo that with people and say like, do they? Could other things keep us safe? Do we need this? Uh, we could let we got 50 percent of people go. My problem is 41 percent of people in the first wave of COVID. There was no crime wave. Do those people need to be in prison? Right. Like these are conversations that we really have to have. I'm talking too long. I'm sorry. No, you're not. You're you're bang on. And I, I you know, for example, the policing costs in Vancouver are 20 percent of the municipal budget, 15 percent in Edmonton. The staggering amounts of money that go to this. And I, I, I take your point on freedom, too. This is something we've talked about at the council, why is it freedom? Why is it freedom, uh, to, you know, to do whatever you want? Why can't it be freedom to live, you know, a decent life and have a decent job? Freedom to have access to health care, freedom to be, you know, anyway, the, the concept of freedom has been completely upended. I wondered if anybody else wanted to jump in on anything that Elle said, please do. Well, I think that, you know, as we're facing an affordability crisis, um, these things need to be looked at with more scrutiny. Why are we spending so much money on the police? I mean, for to me, the Ottawa police gave the greatest example of why we should defund them. Um, and I really do hope that some, you know, that that momentum is built because I really do think that right now in Ottawa is probably the most open time that people are really considering, hey, Maybe we don't need as much police as we thought we did. And, you know, I, I really struggled. I, I would like to even, I would like to question whether or not police solve crime. Because we have, we have seen the debacle with police. And if you think of, you know, Mark Saunders in Toronto and, um, and the, uh, the murders in the gay village in Toronto that were ignored by police. Basically, at this point, you have to do your own police work. So why are we paying them? I mean, this is just the simplest thing ever. Why are we paying people not to do their job? Where else can you not do your job and get $100,000 a year besides Ottawa Transit? <laughs> Oops. 
And uh, just to pick up on something that, said, that Slato put in the chat, she said that, in fact, the RCMP in Wet'suwet'en get more than 100,000. They get a sort of a premium for being on First Nations oh, territory. Oh, so there's, there's a money. premium. But I wondered, Barbara, oh. do you want to jump in on this, this defund the police concept? Like, is that blowing your mind as a person who studies cops and... Just oh, not at all. Groups. Not at all. Uh, no. I mean, I, 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 at least when I'm working with cops, it's usually, you know, folks in the hate crime, uh, hate crime unit who, who, you know, sort of understand uh, this space. But, you know, I am not at all averse to, you know, sort of the, the, the foundational premises of, um, of defund the police, that, you know, the movement, the ideology, the narrative, I think it's absolutely uh, correct that we need to divert funding into the sorts of supports that not just victims need, but also, uh, you know, the communities that are most affected uh, by, by crime. Uh, in their neighborhoods. So, you know, housing, all of those basic needs. So this is, uh, Erica, you asked, why aren't we, uh, someone asked, why aren't we, maybe it was uh, actually you, Anne, asking, why aren't we, uh, you know, paying, putting more money into uh, social social welfare or, social, or housing, all of those sorts of things, because those are social goods. Those are collective goods. This is not what the convoy is interested in. Uh, this is not what uh, the, the right is interested in. They're interested in individual rights, individual freedoms. Uh, it's a very libertarian uh, sort of, uh, of ethos. Uh, and so that's also why they don't, of course, will not throw their, their support behind uh, a defunding movement because uh, A, it's critical of law enforcement who are they see as their allies. Um, but B, uh, you know, they, they fundamentally agree that, uh, that law enforcement is doing their job, that they are, uh, in fact, um, you know, sort of um, surveying the right communities uh, from from their perspective. Uh, so I think that uh, you know the the need to divert this into mental mental health supports, uh, for example. Um, a, a, again, a whole array of alternative mechanisms that, in fact, do make us uh, safer and more secure in our homes and uh, in our in our workplaces and, and on the streets as well. One of the questions I have is why are they doing traffic control? Police officers make a hundred grand a year. It doesn't even even that doesn't make sense. Never mind dealing with mental health or, or um, you know, so-called domestic violence. Like those are not issues that these people are well equipped to well, deal with, and it often goes south as a result. You well, know, so it's often. I mean, this is why they're. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that's long being a bugbear of the right actually they hate red light cameras and so obviously we don't want the data from cameras like with the police because then they can exploit the data but if you have the data being held somewhere else of course that's quite equitable that takes out racial profiling but because that's equal policing you're like oh if I run a red light now I get a ticket and I can't brew it up with the officer that's why the conservatives don't like it they hate traffic control done technologically and I think it's it's because suddenly they actually have to experience policing which they're fine with everybody else police experiencing. But yeah, I mean, we discovered that in our report, we recommended traffic control be taken from the police. And that was a big thing for a lot of people. Uh, go ahead, Barbara, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no I was just going to say, depending on, you know, what, the context for that traffic control, I mean, that's often, um, you know, paid duty, additional paid duty. Uh, so that's that's why so many of them are on sunshine lists. I mean, their, their salary, the base salaries are already that high, but then you add on uh, the uh, the paid duty that they get for maintaining order, uh, if you will, uh, is uh, it's quite lucrative for them. I think, though, one of the things that I wanted to really highlight is that this is not just about, like in our case and in the case of many Indigenous peoples and the land defense that's happening and following our laws, this is not just the case of defunding regular policing. This is about protecting private industry. So not only is there all the regular money for policing, which is not going to our communities with the industry coming in that increases the rates of violence against women, that increases the rates of domestic violence, drug and alcohol use, gang violence. Um, we have had um, an increase like five times or 10 times the nor normal rate in the nearby community of homicides. Like these people are murdering each other our women are being murdered in our communities and nothing's being done about it but this is about actually taking millions like 20 30 million dollars and putting it into protecting private industry specifically like these are what the 
this is what policing is doing right now is they are acting as private mercenaries um you know and on a smaller scale example the the other day my husband um witnessed the police talking to private security that are sitting outside our camp 24 7 and asking how to get to my house so they can come to my home where my children live like this, there's so much collusion happening between industry and the RCMP. They're sharing information with each other and they're getting, they're volunteering to come to be part of this CERG team, this special team of police just to police indigenous people on their lands um, related to industry. They're, pro they're acting as, as mercenaries for private industry. So there's like multi, multi, multi millions of dollars going into protecting private industry um, over and above like the regular policing for their so-called doing their job. I'm going to jump in with a comment from one of the people who's listening to us. Um, uh, this is from Kathy Coach. She says at Ferry Creek, Teal Jones asked for an injunction to ensure that the enforcement order would be enforced, despite the fact that the RCMP was already available to to enforce it. They proceeded to move Sergin at a cost of 10 million to arrest around 1,100 people, of whom four have been found guilty. I wonder if you wanted to make a quick comment on that, Slido. Yeah, I mean, they're actually bringing them in to just mass remove people from the territories. Um, in three years on all the raids on our territories, they just arrest everybody on site, everybody, legal observers, media, anybody and everybody. It's just an excuse to remove indigenous peoples from the land and people who are defending the land in order to push through um, industrial projects. And so there, there have been no charges. There have been no, no, nobody's been convicted of a criminal crime. Nobody's convicted of um, breaking the injunction. Um, they're just using it as a tool to clear the way for industry. So I'm I, trying to find some questions here, but sorry, I, go ahead and jump in Erica or El or- um, I, I also want to point out that at the last COP, I think it was the climate, the climate, uh, the International Climate um, Summit, I think it's COP 26, I think it's 26. Um, Justin Trudeau signed um, an, an understanding, it's non-binding sort of understanding to protect old growth forests. And then turns around and because the RCMP is federal, by the way, and turns around and allows this to happen, the duplicity of our political systems and institutions is unreal. And um, the fact that, you know, internationally, like this country's two faced, internationally, we go out and we say, yes. We hold indigenous rights. We hold people of African descent. Yes, yes, we are multicultural. We are the Shangri-La to, or to the point where I have to tell Americans, no, actually, we're, we're just, we're kind of like you, we're just late, you know? Um, but the fact is that this country is two-faced and once, when it goes out of this country, it will turn around and use us as marketing. And I just wanna put that kind of duplicity out there because I really do think we really start to need, need to start looking at these things just like a layer deeper. Here's a question on the issue of defunding. Maybe you can jump in on this, Elle. Somebody who says, how do we support smaller communities and municipalities who may be disorganized or have less capacity to meet basic needs or resist hate groups? Um, what would you say to people who are wondering about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the advantage smaller communities have is theoretically community cohesion. And one of the things that we actually saw that was effective in Ottawa was when people started going out themselves. So there was the blockade with bicycles where like a few people with bicycles are able to do what the cops couldn't do. Just going out and people bought donuts and coffee and kept each other warm and replaced the barricades in Vancouver. People came out with like bicycles and stopped the convoy from coming in. I don't like even calling it the convoy, like the attempted occupation from coming in period, right? So we know 
that we have the power to collectively organize and protect our communities. Um, an example of this, it, they got co-opted a bit by the police, but Bear Clan was a really good example, right? That started in Winnipeg and then Thunder Bay with people patrolling their own streets and, you know, talking to people, picking up needles, getting to know everybody. Um, Drag the Red, which is really unfortunate because it's the failures of the police to, you know, look for people like Tina Fontaine, but the community went out and started doing that themselves. Um, so there's examples of indigenous community led policing, and I don't even know if we want to call it policing, like community safety models, where people go out and work in their own communities with people they know to, um, and, and we have historic models of this as well. Policing is relatively new, right? Like policing and prisons are not some timeless thing. They're relatively new inventions from like the Victorian period. And we seem to think that we just need to live with them in the same way. So what, what did communities do before? You know, people policed each other. Um, women councils existed and people would go and like, I could think of what my grandmother did where well, they didn't have police in like developing countries. So, you know, they worked together with other women. If someone was being abused, the woman went and like, you know, kicked the man out or told him you better stop that or harassed him or wouldn't sell goods to him or whatever. You know, they had ways of managing this. So we both know that historically our communities have had ways of keeping ourselves safe and that there are other things we can do. So one of the things I would say is like an abolitionist is I'm a practical abolitionist. I think we have to start small and build towards what we want. So organizing your building, having dinner with people like your elders and talking about sexual assault and, and what you've experienced. These are all parts of organizing ourselves, like tenancy groups to fight our landlords. We did this in COVID, bringing groceries to each other. These are all things that actually help us shift the idea that there's some force out there that needs to come and protect us and get us to see that we have capacity to be accountable to each other, to have, and when we have more community cohesion that reduces crime, part of safety is also like when people feel connected to communities, they don't do as much crime because, you know, why would you destroy your, your own community if you feel connected to it, right? Um, we're able to, to talk to each other, to manage conflict, to try and deal with conflict before it happens, to intervene. These are things we need to work on. So um, I think policing actually very much stops us from doing those things because it teaches us that the reflex is the police are the first call. And at the very least, they should be the last call. And I will say too, that this is actually has a lot of impact on police. So if people are listening, they're feeling a bit skeptical. Police don't believe in defunding, but they will admit that being called to do these tasks is extremely traumatic for them as well when they don't know what they're doing. Like, why should an officer be waiting 12 hours in an emergency room for somebody on a mental health call as they're like supposed to do when they don't know what to do? It So it also, to be fair, I suppose, to police and correctional officers and stuff, they're brought into a very violent culture that trains them to be violent. And that has a huge impact on them and their families, which is why we see high rates of domestic abuse among police, military, prison guards, right? We see all of these effects that come from living in a violent society. So um, I don't think we can pretend that investing in violence has no impact. When we were in a slave-based society, it had an impact on the whole society. A whole society becomes involved in violence. Like when you live in a society founded on violence, you have to participate in it and you collude in it and it affects you. So we should stop pretending that the only people that get affected by these things are like certain communities. It affects everybody, including those who then have to go and police. So if we stopped relying on that and actually worked on something else, I long term, and not going to say it would happen tomorrow, like we could all just tomorrow know what to do. We don't know what to do because we haven't worked on it and we haven't been taught, but we do know what to do in the sense of we knew what to do in COVID when our neighbor needed groceries. We knew what to do when we had to like check out a person who was quarantined. We knew we, we know how to do this. It, it's in us. So I really encourage people to like connect to your communities to get in like civic literacy is important. Be involved, like go to your police board, go to your municipal council, understand what's happening and organize together because that also helps us do something else in our communities that isn't just punishing each other, being suspicious of each other, locking our doors against each other, and believing crime is again around every corner, which is what the media is teaching us, which is partly mm -hmm. why we rely on police, right? Mm -hmm. Also, I'm, I'm need, gonna sorry just to, to say, read. Erica, I'm gonna jump in and just say that there's a lot of questions that have come in from people who are listening about solutions such as what uh, I was going to say, so, and I, I'm sure you're going to pick up on it, but I would invite the other panelists to maybe think about that. And I suspect that uh, Slater might have something to say as well about traditional systems of justice. Um, so go ahead, Erica. Um, it's really simple. I, I just think we need to rebuild communities. Like we don't have, we don't have communities like we used to anymore. And that's deliberate. And that's, that is a result of neoliberal economic policies. When you uphold the individual so often, you're upholding isolation, you're upholding depression, 
You're upholding all of the things that we saw in the pandemic when people had nobody around. So we really need to rebuild communities for our mental health, for our own safety, for our own sort of sense of um, beating back sort of isolation and things like that. You're, you're right there, Erica, and I think you know, it's, it's, it is very intentional, right? I mean, the politics of division and polarization that we've seen over the past, uh, well, let's say since 2016, shall we? Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I mean, we were seeing, we had the seeds of that long before Trump, but uh, he certainly has exacerbated the problem as have, you know, some of our own uh, homegrown politicians playing that card that they know they see uh, work so effectively. And so they have also, you know, reinforced uh, those divisions, that us versus them, uh, that is uh, is so effective. And, and you know, you were talking, um, Elle, about, uh, you know, sort of the narratives around crime and who's responsible for crime. All of those, all of those narratives play into, um, you know, ensuring that we we are kept uh, apart we are kept in our own uh, our little silos and, and not able to uh, to work collaboratively so I think it really is about um, you know starting those those conversations at the grassroots as I know many of you do uh, in uh, in your own work and lives so um, yeah I, I appreciate uh, those those efforts and I think that they will have long-term uh, payoffs I'll just jump in and make it, put in a little plug for the Council of Canadians and its chapters across Canada, and also a sidebar project of the Council, which is called the Community Solidarity Project, which was launched in, in an attempt to support those people who are trying to counter things like the convoy occupation. And it was inspired in large part by what was going on in Ottawa, when the community organized itself and blocked people from coming into the neighborhoods and um, tried to confront some of the worst aspects of the occupation, including the so-called Battle of Billings Bridge. Um, and I would like to point people to the chat because there's a lot of great information in the chat. There's links to the work that's being done by our panelists, um, their web pages. And I wanted to correct an error that I made, which is that I referred to Erica as a blogger when in fact she is a mainstream columnist in the Hill Times and she has a podcast. Uh, which was, uh, that was a mistake on my part. I apologize for that. So I'm going to ask if you have anything else. Do you want to add something, Slato? Yeah, sure. I think that it's important to realize that we are all on Indigenous land and that Indigenous peoples have laws that predate colonial laws and that we need to be following those laws um, that are put in place and designed to be able to live in harmony with each other and the land. Um, to the best of our ability. And I think that we all have those responsibilities, Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people who are living on our lands. And so that's what we're trying to do is to um, reoccupy, to build our capacity to live on our lands according to our laws and start to strengthen those laws that enforced our you know, our ability to live sustainably and in peace with each other. And so those are all put in place. They're thousands of years old. Like we don't need to reinvent the wheel. They're there. Colonization did a really good job at breaking them down, but they're still there. And so we need to build them back up again and uphold those laws and those ways of doing things that come from the land and that come from thousands of years of experience. And uh, so that's our goal here on Wet'suwet'en territory. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention also that there's another question uh, about what needs to be done to better inform and educate more people, including more people who may not be aware or even agree that we need to affect change. Like, what's your sense of what the best strategies are to talk across that divide that we mentioned earlier? I think it was Barbara who was talking about the divide and conquer dynamic. What, what do you think would be the best way to approach that? Those are the ongoing, ongoing challenges I think we have is bringing to the table the folks who don't want to be at the table uh, and uh, and engaging those conversations. And I think that, I mean, there's multiple ways to do it, but I think we need to think about the context in which we, uh, you know, live, work and play in, in our daily lives. And, uh, you know, how do we how do we use those venues uh, as a means of getting to people? And I think that the labor movement has such an important role to play here uh, in terms of workplace action, uh, for example, and ensuring 
that uh, you know that uh, employers have in place strategies um, you know that that are intended to keep people safe but also uh, you know strategies on a regular basis that open the open the dialogue and open the conversations around these issues the very hard conversations uh, that, you know if, if we don't have the if we don't begin the conversations and the dialogue excuse me <laughs> the dialogue we're, we're not going to move forward and I think that there is a, an awful lot of uh, hesitancy uh, not just resistance but hesitancy and fear uh, even about talking about race about talking about uh, you know about gender and gender identity about sexuality all of these pieces uh, that are that are so important uh, and so you know what, what can we do in the workplace what can we do I, you know I, I, I think about um, you know athletic uh, teams sports teams even right is there uh, is there space for that in the leagues because we know you know especially in terms of uh, the racism and, and misogyny and, and homophobia that uh, is, you know, gets played out uh, quite literally uh, you know on the ball diamond or in the hockey arena uh, you know those and, and you know I've seen I've been part of uh, of conversations uh, especially around homophobia in in hockey uh, that uh, you know bring brings the players uh, to, to the table as well and really you know what are the what are the stories what are the the experiences of people that have been at the on the other end of that uh, so I think that you know we need to look for these opportunities. It's almost like ca having ca captive audiences uh, in some respects, and uh, and opening the door to those conversations. And I think what's what's especially effective is not you know not just you know lecturing and, and wagging the finger, but but asking questions as well, right? How do you come to that uh, that conclusion? How do you come to uh, you know that that set of beliefs? Uh, and the, that I've, I've found that uh, <clears throat> excuse me to be um, um, again, more effective than simply talking at people. And in prison organizing, obviously, there's people that come in that are like political abolitionists. There's a lot of Black and Indigenous people that come in from that position. But there's also like, you know, a family from like London, Ontario, who supported police in prisons and then their child died in prison or something. And we have to learn to work together, right? Like we're not all on the same page. We A lot of people, we have the same idea that people like, okay, this bad thing happened in prison, but there's fights all the time. Some people are like, why are we all talking about indigenous people? My sister was white and she died. And then we have to like talk that through, right? There's a lot. So I, I do think that organizing together is important and being in coalition with people um, sometimes, sometimes you can, sometimes you just need to be with the people, you know, you, you have to move fast and you want to be with people that are in your crew. But if you have the energy and time, there can be a lot of value in, yeah, like if you're working in a movement to, to say, well, we come from these different positions that we want the same thing. So we're going to have to talk together. We're going to have to work through conflict. We're going to have to question each other. And that can be really valuable. So there's people that have that beautiful skill of being able to really talk people through and, and listen to people and, and, you know, hear what they have to say. And, and yeah, like, I think we do have to understand that, especially with a lot of the growing right-wing stuff, it's a very righteous narrative. It's giving people purpose. Like you're fighting pedophiles, you know, like this is a new thing, like groomers, they really believe that they're out here saving children. They believe they're doing a good thing. They don't think of themselves as like, you know, a hateful person, like to them, they're saving children from the trans menace and they're, you know, so, so like, I think, working with that and, and understanding, I don't know, I, I don't want to just fall into narrative of everybody's just a sad, sad, depressed person. And if we just gave them jobs, they'd stop being racist because that's not the case. Like black people don't have jobs and nobody goes around, you know, excusing everything that we do. So I don't want to just fall into that narrative, but I do think as well that people want community, they badly want to be part of things and they will, you know, become part of a destructive community. I've talked to people that, you know, joined right-wing groups and were told at first that you're handing out pizza to the house people and you're doing volunteer work. And then it becomes, don't you think the immigrants shouldn't be getting as much money? There's like these white homeless people. And before they know it, they're like in this like extremist, like white violent group. So that person does need connection to community and they do need people to listen to them and bring them back. And they do need some compassion, but I also don't want us just fall into the idea that everybody who's racist or hateful is just sad. And if we just love them more, because we know that these <laughs> ideologies, well, because they run through society. It's not like an anomaly. We're like, how did you become racist in Canada? Like founded on the genocide of indigenous people, ongoing genocide of indigenous people, anti-blackness, like what a shock. Like, why are you against immigrants? You know, when we control our border. So, you know, like let's not pretend this is some kind of anomaly, but I do think that we have to recognize, especially now people feel so isolated and it's so easy to go on YouTube or whatever group and give, be given these powerful and very, in some ways, simple narratives that allow you to have meaning. And we have to be aware of that and try and inject something into that and intervene. 
Several uh, people have gone uh, on the chat and asked for some more specific resources with regard to the resurgence of the far right, Barbara. I wonder if you can point people, make a quick comment about that and point people to some resources that they can check out to get that uh, information. Because we did say in the title of our, of our panel that it was policing protest and the resurgence of the far right. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the sad thing, sad truth is that there aren't a lot of people working in this space as, as academics. I think that there are a lot of, uh, you know, increasing number of community-based groups, but uh, I mean, our own Center on Hate, Bias, and Extremism, we have plenty of resources there. Um, the Organization for, for Prevention of Violence in Alberta uh, is another uh, another resource. Anti-hate um, network. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, anti, uh, yeah, Canadian anti-hate network. Um, yep, yeah, good. I mean, lots of, of good uh, articles there. I mean, they're really on top of monitoring the day-to-day -day, uh, activities uh, of the movement. So, yeah, I think that's uh, those are some starting points for you. And and that, you know, we're all we're all sort of connected. So, uh, you know, the, the the links on each of our websites will will take you deeper and deeper. Uh, just as it, just as the algorithms work for the far right, they can work for uh, you know anti uh, anti racists as well. Um, and again, I, I'll point people, just sorry to say that in the chat, there are a number of links, including the one that uh, Erica just referred to, the Anti-Hate Network and the school where Barbara teaches. Go ahead, Erica. Um, I want to pick up with something else said, because this is something that drove me. I It was just like, it was maddening. There, was a, there were a lot of reports about the bouncy castles and the parties the yeah. and the music and the hot tub and all the family fun that the far right has to offer. And I just want to say, I, I explain it like this. Nike has a kick-ass workout app. Let me tell you something. That thing is free. It'll give you, it'll, it, they recruited trainers, fitness people, Olympic people from all over the world. Why are they giving it to you free though? because they have your data. They know when you need the shoes, they're gonna connect it to their store. They know where you run, how far you run, um, if you run. If you don't run, they know other stuff about you. And that is the point. The point is the bouncy castles, the hot tub are to bring you in before they sell, before they sell you the great replacement theory. That is the point. Your, their job is to get you into their ecosystem, into their media ecosystem. And one of the things I've been quite critical about, you know, a resistance to this is one, number one is unions. They need to do better. Okay. But also what about all these far, what about all these lefty foundations? You know, the Canadian Women's Foundation. Um, I think Atkinson has a foundation, whatever it's called, but there are all these lefty foundations all over the place, taking money, having money. And where is their responsibility? Where is the responsibility of these leftward institutions that literally just sit here and sure they'll have panels, no offense, um, <laughs> and they'll have their discussions and then that's it because there are those of us doing that media work because that communication work is so important and we're losing. Let me say that again, we're losing badly. We don't have, we don't have the ecosystem of resources that the right has, the far right has. And I don't see many foundations or unions or people with, or people with money trying to take, trying to fill that gap. That is my point. The challenges are many. <laughs> I was just going to say very briefly, like, um, you know, we, we were part of an unhoused, unhoused encampment and there was military guys that were white supremacists coming around, like recruiting with the unhoused people. And a lot of the people didn't understand the rhetoric, right? Like, so if you know, you could hear it, but, and what they were really trying to do is say like, white people shouldn't be unhoused in Canada, right? Like they give resources to other people, but like, this is literally like how coordinated it is, right? And I had to keep pulling people aside and being like, these guys are racist because it, some people are like, oh, this sounds neat. It's like, oh yeah, we have an idea for a compound. I'm like, this is a white nationalist compound, but it's not on the surface, right? Like it, it's underneath. And then obviously like once they suck you in. So yeah, I mean, the, the recruiting is real, right? And it's through our military, it's through 
police. And then it's also like literally people will go to a house encampment and try and like bring those people in. Um, they will go everywhere. So then our question is, why aren't we at the unhoused encampment giving people food and connecting people to community and fighting for housing? You know, like we need to be doing those things. Um, and if we're not doing it, and, and like, if we're not organized, we're not in solidarity and we're not working through silos and we're not creating a big movement, then, you know, like, obviously people are gonna go to the fringes. So we have to, I think, do, and we are doing it. I hate when we say the left isn't organizing because I'm like, I'm out there every day organizing. Indigenous people are on the land for years organizing. Like we're organizing, but we always need to organize together and keep building that solidarity. And that in, in effect was the thinking behind tonight's panel was to try and bring people from across the country who may have heard of each other but haven't necessarily talked to each other or seen each other speak. That was the idea of tonight's webinar. I wondered if you wanted to add a last word, Slato, before Elle reads her poem to close tonight's proceedings. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank all the other panelists. This was such a great conversation. I learned so much and I really appreciate all the different perspectives that got brought um, to the floor today and that hopefully people can take away and, you know, see all the all of the different ways that policing and the rise of, of the far right are impacting our communities. So thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure and an honor to have you with us as well as Erica and Elle and Barbara. Um, but I'm wondering, are you ready to, are you ready to give us a yes. little bit of your artistry, Elle? Okay, I mean, it's hard to choose because we did so many issues, but <laughs> so I was gonna do something else, but I think I'll do this one because I feel like since so much of this, we talked a lot about what Suetin and, and environment and stuff. So hopefully this does it for us, but if I make the wrong choice, I'm sorry, then there's other poems you'll have to hear another time. Or buy your books. <laughs> <laughs> by my book. They say it isn't a crisis because we haven't burned up yet. Planet's getting hotter, but no reason for you to sweat. Bumblebees are under an extinction threat, but money's sweeter than honey, so don't you get upset. The CEOs are off buying up another private jet. There's a hefty year-end bonus for the oil execs. Trudeau bought out the pipelines and all the rich invest. The clock's ticking down to zero, but there's dollars in the chest. When they find the corporate polluters, it barely makes a dent. No charges of CEOs, but they charge the fishermen. Go check out Picto Landing and just absorb the stench. When they get scientific reports, they just bury the contents. And it seems like there's a cover-up across the continent. Follow the money in politics. They fund the president. And whoever's in the White House, corporations pay the rent. And that's why we funnel money, weapons to the Saudi government. So they say the land defenders are illegal protests. The grandmothers by the river are facing down arrest and there isn't a court in town to prosecute the resource theft while conservative politicians suck up to the yellow vest standing rock and unistoten we never can forget rcmp breaking through the gates and tearing down the tents they put the leaders into cages because they said that they're a threat while the courts hand out injunctions to protect the one percent the rest of us can go away and stand behind the fence. Indigenous nations telling us that they don't have consent, that they bulldoze all the treaties and the law is always bent until the polar bears are drowning because the, all the glaciers melt. And the poor people are drowning, the first to be oppressed. Indigenous and Black communities where all their trash is left. There's landfills, tar pits, sewage plants beside most of the rest. They don't admit the rates of cancer that send us to our deaths while the pipelines keep on running. In the east and in the west, they've blasted through the sacred mountains and they scrape the ocean's depths. Oil spills across the surface for miles and miles they stretch and they say that larger than Texas is the Pacific trash vortex. And maybe garbage islands is where they'll relocate us next. Canadian mines poison the Amazon and people dispossessed and they've buried all the bodies deep where light is never met. So the only place you find the headlines is on the internet because the media gets their money from the same place politicians get. Bought and paid for, bought and paid for. So the narrative is set. And don't trust the universities because they won't divest. Wasn't Peter Mansbridge speaking to petroleum interests? Aren't our shiny buildings from the money they invest? Don't they call security whenever we dissent? Don't they profit from the military industrial complex? In the shadow of oil money, aren't we all? 
just silhouettes. And there's another war for oil that's running up the debt. Another bomb lands on a hospital or on a minaret. There's refugees along the border. Another headline frets and coke done stole the water while the cholera infects. And Monsanto patented the seeds, even such a tiny speck. The farmers light themselves on fire or they're hanging by the neck. But who cares about their life if someone gets a bigger check? If they could privatize the sun, they'd charge us when the rays descend. But it still snows in winter, so they say the climate's doing well. They say it's just a blip all these extreme weather events. Wildfires rage in California, pull the prisoners from their cells. After all, if you want to make a money omelet, you got to break a couple eggs. In the typhoons and the hurricanes, we might break a couple legs. And when the flood waters rise, you might need a couple shelter beds. But if you think there's climate change, well, then you shouldn't hurt your head. Just keep filling up the tank until we go into the red. Just keep filling up the ballot box with votes against yourself. The kids are walking out of classes trying to clean up adult mess. There's wildlife choking on the garbage and strangling in the nets. There's more roadkill on highways every day as suburbs manifest and we'll all one day be roadkill if the crisis ain't addressed. We'll all drink the poison water when the chemicals ingest. And once we've destroyed the planet, there's nowhere else to rent. When we've destroyed ourselves, there'll be no more time to spend. And so there's no more time to lend if we don't want this world to end. There's time to make a change if we want this world to mend. Will it take until our grandchildren for us to have regrets? We have to want a world beyond some cash and private jets. Because racism and poverty and war all intersect. When all of us are suffering for someone else's wealth, but there's still so few of them and we have all the strength. We may think they have the power, but power always bends and there's power in our breath. There's power in our steps. There's power in the breadth of nature and in the ocean's depths, so they will not steal our futures, not by handshakes, deals and stealth. It is their time that is coming because their power always ends. Or climate change, racism, and policing all in one. Oh my God, that was unbelievable. <laughs> I think we have to uh, make you the poet laureate of the Council of Canadians. My goodness, that was absolutely great. That was like and, fire. You know, I really <laughs> want to send my, my solidarity and love out to the Wet'suwet'en people and to your struggles. So thank you for holding it down for all of us. As we know, Indigenous sovereignty is the greatest threat to all of these powers. And we know that you are on the front lines for all of us. So we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We really do. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Slato, because I know it's a bit of a challenge and the time difference and the whole thing. Thank you so much to you as well, Barbara. And I would encourage people who are interested in pursuing research into the, the alt-right to go and check out uh, what Barbara's doing at the, the New Tech University in Oshawa, which I hadn't actually heard of till I had to book Barbara. So that's really cool. And it's really lovely to have Erica who has such a great sense of humor and who's so dynamic and who does such great things. And you have your, your Twitter account is called what again? It's called Wicked. You're on mute, I'm afraid. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, sorry. My Twitter account, it's Wicked Chick. W-I-C-K-D-C-H-I-Q. <laughs> I also want to point out my podcast, Bad and Bitchy, and that's <laughs> at Bad and Bitchy. Um, we talk a lot about these issues. We also break down a lot of policy, okay. like that's that actually is accessible. So and it's been, BIPOC centered. Okay. I think it's so great to have had all four of you tonight. I'm, thank you so much. We're super grateful to you to have made the time. And that poem was just like absolutely excellent. Thank you. And if you um, want so, to join us on the breach, we will be doing being live during the conservative debate. And we will also be doing candy reviews. So if you're in the pod, as I've named our, our listeners, bring your candy and uh, get your bingo cards, which you can get at the breach. And we'll be watching the conservative debate live next week. So because every will. movement needs a poet and needs music and needs a sense of humor. So um, so thank you so much to our four panelists. Thank you to Eagle Claw Toms, who's our Zoom captain and troll bouncer, to Dylan Penner, Angela Giles, and Nicholas Barry Shaw for their support and insight and great suggestions. I'd also like to thank John Cartwright, who's the chair of the Council of Canadians and the person who launched the idea of the Community Solidarity Project. And a special thanks to all of you who've been listening and asking such smart questions. I hope we did them justice. This is part of an ongoing process. So if we didn't get to you this time, maybe we'll get to you next time. And now I need to hand things back to Ravi and Christina to close the proceedings.
Well, actually, Anne, you just covered it very articulately, but I wanted to extend our thanks to you for hosting Anne, and Anne did a lot of the work behind the scenes to pull together, and thank you for also relaying the names of our wonderful, incredible superhero staff team who helped pull this evening together as well, so thank you very much, and thanks to the uh, uh, over 500 people. We peaked at about 500 people joining uh, this evening. There were 1,500 registered. Christine, I'll hand it to you for any final comments, but once again, thank you to our panelists on behalf of the Council of Canadians. And I'll also just say thank you to you as the participants with your patience as we got through the questions that you that you raised and the ones that we were able to pass on. We were also taking stock of the resources that you were listing also, as well as the resources listed by the panelists. And I'll just invite the panelists to take a look at some of the open questions, which are mostly encouragement and thanks from the pan from the participants for everything that you offered and gave this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for your generosity of spirit. It's really been a pleasure. It's really very lovely. So I I feel badly, like I feel like we created a kind of a community here on our little webinar and now we have to say goodbye. So we'll just have to try and do it again, I hope. <laughs> it's been really a joy and a pleasure. And I, I feel better about the world and I hope everybody who's with us also feels a bit better about the world and empowered by Elle's energetic and wonderful delivery of that incredible poem. So thanks to everybody. Bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Merci beaucoup. Nyawe. Yeah,